Hi, friends. Good to see you. It's the second time that we do our expert talk virtually, and uh, we are continuing our success from the last we did. It's always good to build a combined uh, situation from print to talk to bridge the gap during these times of pandemic where it's better to stay safe and use electronic communication. We start our session and uh, a welcome to the people on the podium for the expert talk and a welcome to all the attendees in the world. So it's uh, my attempt to help getting the white band gap devices uh, introduced into more applications and uh, to bridge between the semiconductor manufacturer and the users, this tech talk in conjunction with the previous published articles in my publication should help to make a step forward. Now uh, it's time to look at the questions. The first question is on the screen. To me as a user of an X electro vehicle, what specifically does SIC give me compared to silicon? Thank you very much, Kudos. A warm welcome from my side as well. Uh, thanks you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, very interesting question. Let's maybe start on a not too scientific level. As a as a user of an XEV, um, you are most probably interested in the range you you can drive with your XEV. Um, that might be also the topic you're always struggling um, while the discussions with other colleagues are still using uh, conventional cars. And it is very obvious using silicon carbide elements, power semiconductors within an electric car um, can significantly increase the range you can drive with the same power, the same energy you have stored, it, stored in, a, in, a, in a battery. Therefore, it's, it's a, um, a way um, for more sustainability for, for longer um, range drives, as well um, helping and, uh, and supporting the breakthrough for, for XEVs. Thank you, Tobias. Why is Infineon recommending 18 volt driving voltage, gate voltage probably? Yes, hello everybody. Um, thanks also from my side, Bodo, for having me here. And um, okay, so why is Infineon recommending 18 volt driving voltage? So the reason is, um, let's say, relatively um, simple. Um, the cool SIC MOSFET um, doesn't, um, it doesn't have an RDS on which is uh, um, completely enhanced at uh, um, 15 volt compared to super junction devices, for example, or AGBTs. And this is the reason why Infineon is recommended to drive the silicon carbide MOSFET at 18 volt compared to 15 volt, for example, because in this way it is possible to gain, uh, um, to reduce the RDS on by about, uh, let's say, uh, 20 to 30 percent and at 25 degrees. And this uh, of course, is enabling a general improvement of all the figures of merit, because of course we will have a, a lower RDS on, but 
with the same, uh, let's say, capacitances of the device. And therefore, this is a benefit for the end customer, which is able to have a more performant device. It is important to mention that our silicon carbide MOSFET can also be driven at uh, uh, lower driving voltages, um, down to 15 volts. But of course, this would cause a reduction um, of the performances, which means essentially an increased RDS on. Thank you. We are waiting for the next question to pop up. It's addressed to Salvatore from ST Microelectronics. The question is about the intrinsic body diode of an SIC MOSFET. Is it enough performing specific in bridge topologies or is it recommended to put an SIC short key barrier diode in parallel to the MOSFET? So thank you, Bodo. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I say that uh, every, like the MOSFET, also the silicon carbide has indeed an intrinsic body diode. Uh, well, the re reverse uh, recovery performance of the sick body diode are actually outstanding because the, it offers outstanding, uh, extremely low reverse recovery current, small reverse recovery time. So uh, I would say that uh, on top of that, uh, it shows also very low dependency on the by temperature. So all these uh, features uh, in the end uh, turn into minimize, uh, minimize the reverse recovery uh, charge uh, that make it uh, by far better than any silicon MOSFET. Uh, while compared to a silicon carbide Schottky barrier diode, uh, the reverse recovery performance are almost equivalent. Not, not the same, but uh, very close to, to that. So uh, I, I, I can add also that, I could add also that to complete the picture, that uh, the silicon carbide intrinsic body diode, unlike the uh, Schotty barrier diode, is made of a PN junction. Uh, so typically the VF, the forward voltage value is uh, uh, a bit higher, approximately three volt, uh, making of course the Schotty barrier diode a, a bit more performing. But uh, let's say that uh, say all these uh, features, uh, uh, the, the body diode is, uh, is uh, very robust, is very performing, the intrinsic body diode. So we recommend and we suggest uh, to, to use the, the MOSFET without any need of external, of external Schottky barrier diode. Uh, and the, the result will be approximately uh, comparable. Of course, if the customer want to get even better performance, it's always possible to, to add an external uh, uh, Schottky barrier diode that can bring additional boost to the, the, the efficiency. Thank you, Francesco. That sounds... Salvatore, yes. Salvatore, sorry. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you. Uh, that uh, sounds good to know. And now we are up to Francesco, to the wonderful Scandinavian area, Denmark, the Aalborg University. I remember that uh, EPE took place in 2007 in Aalborg. That's mm -hmm. already a while ago again. So the question is, you pointed out in your article how critical high temperature operations are to SIC MOSFETs. Do you think this is a real barrier to massive SIC adaption in automotive? Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Bodos, for your nice, uh, for inviting me, first of all, and remembering a little bit EP uh, back in 2007 in Orbor. Uh, let me seize also the opportunity to tell everyone that EP is supposed to be returning to Orbor in 2023. And I myself, I'll be, I'll be serving humbly as a general chair. So everyone is welcome to come again to Orbor. 
thank you for your question. Uh, well, uh, you're right. I, I did. I pointed out that uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs are a little bit more prone to uh, high temperature issues, especially when you approach 170, 175 junction, uh, degree Celsius junction temperature. But the answer to your question is actually no. I don't think it is a real barrier. Well, I'm not an expert of uh, electric vehicle design, uh, neither on the thermal aspects, but I would expect that uh, you not have, a, being uh, not, uh, at least the pure electric vehicles do not have a combustion engine in them, so I would, ex I would expect, uh, you know, uh, the uh, heat generation because of losses, which is massive, which is actually twice as much the generated power in the combustion engine is totally uh, over, is totally uh, disappearing when you move to pure electric vehicles. So as a consequence, I would expect the, you know, the overall uh, cooling temperature would be also lower. And uh, in my opinion, this is a great opportunity to seize for a silicon carbide technology because the temperature is not an issue anymore. You may remember that there has been great European projects and not only around the high temperature semiconductors, but actually moving to electric vehicles does not, in my opinion, of course, it does not really demand for moving to higher temperatures. So my answer is definitely no, it is not a real barrier. So let's go silicon carbide to in, on, on automotive. Let's do this. Thank you, Francesco. And I'm looking forward it's a short car ride relatively from Laboe through Kiel, Flensburg, reaching Aalborg. So I'm looking forward to be in 2023 in Aalborg to join EPE at that time. Sure. Thank you. The next question will pop up. Uh, here we are, and it's addressed to Thomas from Fnet Silica. What's the reason for two output gate drivers at SIC drivers, and where is there a Miller clamp version? Um, thank you, Bodo, for the invite. Um, also, thank you, Francesco, for the invite. I hope um, um, I can get there. Um, you, you you will receive an email from me if, if I, I can get there. So all from from the Alps going up to Denmark. Um, yeah, and then uh, the question: What's the reason for two output gate drivers? Um, basically, the reason is uh, also EMC. Um, you have in the in the gate drivers a top MOSFET and a bottom MOSFET, and um, you can both tie to the gate directly. Or what's really recommended um, use some resistors in, in the way there so you can steer um, independently the switch on and the switch off um, time for the transistor um, and this helps you a lot in, in tuning um, your system in, in a way that you got the best performance out of it and also meet your EMC goals. Um, there are Miller clamp versions, um, but they don't have two output gate drivers. So you would have to make your way around with um, having in the gate path a diode and resistor. So you separate those two from, from one pin, um, but they're definitely there. So, Thank you, Thomas. That's uh, good to know. And uh, I know from the past as if you went higher in frequency, it's always better to tailor the switching individual for a half bridge upper on lower pad. It saves you some headaches in the lab. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So my backstage is bringing up the next to Nico from Infineon. What's the difference with respect to the diode forward voltage and the resulting positive aspects and drawbacks? Okay, so I think here we're referring to the um, forward volt voltage drop of the body diode. So it's a similar question, or let's say it's partially related to, to what Salvatore also commented before. So 
as uh, let's say we know, we have that uh, for silicon carbide MOSFET, the um, forward voltage drop of the body diode is uh, higher compared to superjunction devices. And this must be uh, taken into account um, when customers basically replace superjunction devices, for example, with silicon carbide MOSFETs. Because if this aspect is not taken into account, and for example, the death times of um, the applications are not optimized in order to minimize the conduction of the uh, MOS uh, MOSFET body diode, what could happen is that, uh, for example, um, the silicon carbide MOSFET could actually um, apparently perform worse than a superjunction MOSFET. But uh, the key here is really to tune the um, that times and to optimize the application around the device, which is basically um, utilized. And uh, as also uh, Salvatore explained very well before, we have to say that uh, um, the, um, MOS the diode of the body diode of the silicon carbide MOSFET is great uh, under uh, many many aspects. So it has an extremely low reverse recovery charge, extremely low reverse recovery time. Um, therefore, also our recommendation is essentially to, to use it, just taking care of optimizing the dead times in half bridge based applications. Thank you, Nico. Thanks. So we can continue to our next question addressed to Tobias. To what extent can the findings from an e-mobility be transferred to other applications with SIC? Thanks uh, for this question, Budo. Uh, we, have been, we have been discussing already on, uh, on e-mobility quite a bit, uh, the past few, few questions. Um, in silicon carbide, um, especially in regards to um, the, the chip uh, topology, how the, the silicon carbide chip itself is, is being built up, it's rather simple um, to transfer that uh, to higher voltages as well. As an example, to 1.7 kV or even 3.3 kV. And uh, with this given possibility and um, the benefits on silicon carbide, on RDS, on, on the higher current density, as well as the possibility to build MOSFETs for, for these higher voltages, um, this allows um, a wide use. Um, as example, use in traction applications, trains, um, that's something what we see more and more, um, using silicon carbide devices in 3.3 uh, kilovolt two-level converters in, in trains, high-speed trains as one example. And I believe that's, that's by far not a limitation. It will go even to higher voltages. It will create some additional challenges in, in immobility um, regarding life cycle, power cycle. You cannot compare the requirements there um, uh, to, uh, to industrial applications or also to traction applications. They are by far more stringent. But with the experience uh, on the high volume as well and on the designs of the chips as well as on the modules, on the power modules, um, this already helps right now to transfer these technologies, um, as I mentioned, to, to, to other topologies. And, that will further improve also in, in the future as well. Thank you, Tobias. It seems from your results that short circuit ruggedness is still a great challenge for SIC MOSFETs. However, modern gate drivers can detect short circuits and safely turn off the device in one to two microseconds. Why are you still that concerned about that? Right. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, unfortunately, I am, and for good reasons. Um, basically, we've been working uh, also with, uh, with uh, a PhD student on this at Albrecht University and trying uh, figuring out what the effective damage uh, caused by the short circuit event uh, looks like in uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs. And I don't have great news actually, because uh, apparently nothing has happened even after, you know, one and one and a half microseconds. But actually what it turns out is that uh, the device uh, has accumulated something, has, has you know, uh, uh, got some damage, which is not obvious uh, times zero, 
But if you keep operating it, uh, then uh, the degradation becomes faster. And we have been doing this by, you know, uh, composing uh, silicon carbide and, uh, sorry, uh, short circuit, still, of course, on silicon carbide, short circuit events and uh, um, power cycling. And what we could figure out is that uh, power cycling ends up a lot, you know, uh, faster uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a degradation and eventual and eventually uh, lift off because of even one single short circuit event. So the point is that, and if you are interested, uh, there is also this PhD thesis, which has been finalized and it is publicly available if you want to hear more. But the point is here is that uh, we are not certain how much damage is hidden behind the short circuit event. So I, I, I feel like this is the major barrier, I would say to adoption of silicon carbide in automotive, because you know, everyone knows that the short circuit, uh, you know, uh, ruggedness is one of the main uh, I would say uh, demands in 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 automotive market. So uh, still a way to go on this side. It would be very interesting to see the outcome of the investigation. And uh, to me, I feel that especially on these tiny ship sizes, the soldier. Uh, over time will get weaker. I was involved uh, looking into these kind of aspects with silicon a while ago. So it's important to see the long-term reliability uh, of devices. Thank you, Francesco. We are looking to the next question, which is addressed to all of you. And that's the question I mostly hate the max most, it's the question for pricing, but I got teached once from an expert that pricing is the highest physical uh, aspect to get something running. If the price of a technical solution is not okay, it will not find its way into the market. So the question is, the price of SIC power modules to drop to a price level that can beat SI uh, silicon modules when taking into account the increase of efficiency and reduction of passive components. Who, who, who wants to answer first? If you don't mind, I, I can start uh, with oh. my personal thought. Um, okay, Tobias. Uh, I have a very clear statement from my side. I expect that this is going to happen within the next three years. Um, and this is uh, on, on two factors, uh, looking back what happened in the past and also seeing uh, what's, what's moving forward in terms of uh, process development as, as well as, as volume on silicon carbide overall. Um, I believe it's, uh, it's within, within three years. Of course, it depends at the end on the application and the voltage level, as I already elaborated on before. But I think it's, it's time now to start with design considerations uh, to prepare everything um, to be ready um, uh, to, um, um, to use then the silicon carbide modules as soon as they are in a reasonable price level compared to the benefits they create on, 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 on different topologies and circuits uh, with the passives as well as with the converted topologies. Thank you, Tobias. It, it, this, this question sometimes feels a bit like um, fortune telling um, because you, you not clearly know what's coming. Um, but I think I, I really agree with uh, Tobias. Um, I think that some applications will start sooner, some will take more time that has to do with markets, with certifications and with the product size itself in product size in terms of how many magnetics are incorporated in the design and um, what's the actual benefit then SIG can bring to like shrink the magnetics and uh, bring a price advantage there. So there's many, many factors that uh, play into that. 
Thank you, Thomas. I understand fully. In the mid 80s, I was introducing the IGBT called COMFET at that time from RCA. And uh, it was uh, a hell of a work to talk with the people in industry to get acceptance to a new switch device. And uh, when it, the benefits were shown clearly from the applications, it was running by itself. So the next question is about, could you comment on the challenges of multi-chip SIC power module design in comparison to the lithium IGBT multi-chip power modules? That's a question which has a, some kind of open doors to understand. The lithium IGBT multi-chip power modules, we know that the market has the lithium IGBT modules combined with uh, SIC diodes. And we know that we have SIC IGBT modules with SIC uh, diodes. So who, 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 who wants to make a comment to that question? Um, I can uh, make a short comment. Uh, yeah, uh, if you thank want, you, Francesco. Yes, um, well, I, I can tell you what I see from a reliability perspective. Uh, what happens is uh, silicon carbide is a great material and power density can be raised by a factor of two, three, even higher than that. And this basically uh, takes um, the uh, chip sides uh, basically lower, uh, make chips smaller than the uh, IGBT in silicon counterparts. But one of the issues I tried also to point out recently is that this reduces dramatically the area you can have for landing your bond wires. And this basically shifts the problem from the semiconductor itself to the package. So basically you are incredibly increasing the current density in your bond wires. And, uh, and there is nothing you can do uh, other than uh, moving to another bonding technology, which is unfortunately even more expensive than bond wires, right? You can talk about, you know, uh, double side soldering, uh, or yeah. you can talk about uh, uh, whatever stripe or whatever uh, silver uh, interconnections. But of course, you you are going the opposite direction because actually what you want is to reduce the overall price, not increase it. So I would see I would say basically the challenge is not in the semiconductor itself, but it on it's on the implications of the semiconductor of the great performance of semiconductor has on the module manufacturing and design, first of all, and then manufacturing. I agree, Francesco, but I see the challenge to get away from bonding in high current density applications and modules to other bonding, not bonding types to pressure systems to soldier and uh, uh, more uh, uh, sized uh, contact systems that had been discussed also for quite a while. And uh, I remember that even in the 90s, uh, people already worked on, on the uh, uh, surface side soldiering uh, of uh, dyes to get a better contact uh, for the current flow. Thank you, Bodo. Maybe I can also um, add a statement from my side. Yeah, to be yes. I can fully confirm what Francesco says. It's, uh, it's getting very challenging on the module side. Uh, especially the, you need to find or we need to find a balance between the existing housings, power modules being established on silicon, uh, being designed in, in many converters and offering the opportunity to have the same power modules also with silicon carbide and therefore 
let's say, to boost existing uh, converter designs as well. Um, absolutely, having uh, more than 100 dams on a 5 by 5 millimeter die and uh, to, do, to, to do connections, um, that's quite challenging. Of course, you can think about um, uh, other connection topologies, uh, technology, silver sintering, whatever on both sides, whatever you can do. However, I believe uh, bonding is still a way to go. Um, there is also on bonding side, I would say we have not yet reached a kind of uh, perfect level. You can work together with copper diet of systems. You can use with various uh, bonding materials and um, having, having a look at, uh, at, at these po um, um, possibilities, I believe it's uh, still a way to go and it will allow us to, to significantly boost um, current out of existing modules. I think in, 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 in parallel, one of the advantages um, having these small uh, chip sizes and the, the high current per, per chips, let's say like this, is also that you can um, parallel many, many of them in an existing module. As you're talking about 20, 40, or even more um, um, uh, dies in parallel. Um, what obviously requires um, certain demand, the dimension considerations in the module itself, uh, low stable strain inductance, very important, as well as um, uh, current sharing um, between the different dies. Uh, you can also do that in, in, various, in, in various ways. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, field, and um, we will also see. In future, I believe there is uh, much to improve. We can we can still learn a lot. I fully agree that uh, there is a lot of improvement for the future. Let me just make a small uh, comment. Electronics sometimes builds up on history. If we look to the sockets of tubes they have been used to put TL3 metal transistors in and now the TL247 uh, uh, plastic devices are fitting in the metal uh, transistor uh, sockets so it's uh, over decades trying to stay at the same kind of footprint it sometimes uh, needs an uh, innovation step so let let's move on are there applications where you would still use an IGBT rather than an SIC device? For example, the low levels of gate charge and also <coughs> COSS, CISS in SIC MOSFETs compared with IGBTs would make them more sustainable Respectable to noise, especially at low frequency applications. Let me make just a simple comment from my side. You can tailor the gate to get the, the switching to lower noise. That's uh, simple to do for an SIC device to get to lower switching and uh, reducing noise. But let me have your uh, comments. Let me add uh, something to what you just mentioned, Bodo. So yeah, um, yeah as, you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, having, uh, let's say, improving uh, the, um, let's say, stability and uh, of uh, the gas source voltage of uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs is something which is absolutely possible. Uh, with uh, taking some, uh, um, let's say, care of uh, uh, in the design of the driving circuitry. But uh, I think that we also recommend is, of course, to use the Kelvin source pin or to use products with Kelvin source pin, which, uh, are, um, which is basically helping to, let's say, decouple the um, gate source signal uh, from the parasitics of the circuit. 
And this is something which is uh, we, we recommend to all of our customers because this is also, let's say, helping to significantly improve the switching performances, especially at high currents. And um, about the second point, so let's say, um, where would I still use IGBTs uh, instead of silicon carbide MOSFETs? So here I would say that, of course, uh, uh, IGBTs are still making a lot of sense in all those applications where the power density uh, or the efficiency is not, uh, uh, let's say, a, a very uh, um, strict requirement. So applications which um, can basically cope with uh, um, a significant, with some uh, which do not uh, have uh, space constraints or volume constraints are uh, still addressable with uh, IGBT. Of course, moving to SIC would uh, uh, lead to an improvement in efficiency and performance, but this has always to be balanced and uh, traded off uh, with cost. And so this is basically, I would say that there is no general rule in this case. We cannot say um, yeah, this application uh, can be still addressed with uh, LGBTs rather than SIG. So it's always, let's say, a sort of a trade-off and uh, it really depends on, on the design and, and on this very specific application that we, we want to talk about and we want to address. Thank you. Do we have more questions coming on? Okay. To Salvatore, can I drive the SIC MOSFET was even a negative VGS value. Is it allowed by absolute maximum ratings? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bodo. So, yeah, well, uh, let's say that uh, uh, our view on this uh, question is uh, quite clear that it not only yeah, it is uh, possible, uh, but uh, I would say is uh, even recommended uh, above all uh, for bridge topologies. Uh, why using a negative uh, voltage, VGS uh, minus five volt up to minus two, uh, prevent uh, for sure from any risk of uh, cross conduction due to unwanted uh, turn on of the of the MOSFET, and even slightly improves, uh, I would say, the the the, the losses. Uh, while uh, maintaining still a safe margin uh, with respect to the um, absolute maximum ratings that uh, in the case of a, a silicon carbide from ST, um, I, uh, but I would say quite typical in the market, uh, is up to minus 10 volt. Uh, in addition, uh, a negative uh, VGS uh, voltage applied in combination with the driver with the Miller clamp uh, protection. For instance, uh, ST offered the ST gap 2 uh, series, uh, represent the, yeah, the, the ideal condition to drive the, the, the MOSFET, the silicon carbide MOSFET, at the safest, safest and uh, performing conditions. Uh, as ST, we have uh, also uh, released the several application nodes. I could uh, recommend uh, uh, application node uh, 4671 and uh, application node uh, uh, 5355, uh, where these topics are, I would say, analyzed. But also, uh, yeah, there is some uh, article also, the, the one written by, by Thomas uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, afford the argument uh, in particular how to drive the, the SIC with uh, the silicon carbide with uh, the ST gap driver. Thank you, Salvatore. To Nico, the question Why are you using SIC in a 65 kilohertz switching frequency in the totem pole PFC? Thanks for your question, Bodo. So, um... Let's say that, um, okay, to answer, let's say the first part of the question, I would say that uh, silicon carbide is uh, an enabler of uh, bridgeless topologies as the CCM totem pole uh, uh, boost PFC. And um, this is uh, essentially um, helping to uh, increase the power density and efficiency of uh, um, the PFC stage and also it's an enabler uh, 
of the of um, for bidirectional designs. And this is, let's say, answering at least uh, why we want to use the silicon carbide in the totem pole PFC. The second part of my answer is related more to the uh, switching frequency value that um, has been selected and, and might, uh, might not seem too high um, for a wide band gap material. But here, um, the answer is, is pretty simple. The CCM totem pole PFC, as the name says, is operating in continuous conduction mode. Um, therefore, basically, um, the um, silicon carbide MOSFETs, which are uh, used in the fast leg of this uh, topology, are essentially undergoing an hour switching uh, um, at each commutation cycle. Therefore, um, as in every hard switching topology, there is uh, an optimum between uh, conduction and switching losses, um, and which has also to be, let's say, coupled with uh, the, um, let's say, optimum frequency that can essentially um, um, lead to the um, lowest, uh, to, to the magnetic or to the choke, uh, which can have the lowest volume. And therefore, after performing some uh, analysis, uh, um, we, we basically saw that uh, having a switching frequency of 65 kilohertz was providing the best efficiency um, for our specific um, design of our demo board. Thank you. And there is the next question. I have heard that passing current through a body diode can cause defects in the element and degrade its characteristics. Has each company solved this problem? If I understand the question right, is uh, the question addressed to the reverse current in the body diode. I think forward current to me is not uh, anything that could really have an effect in killing a diode or degrading, but the reverse uh, is something, and as mostly this is a cell structure, my understanding from the past is that the cell structure must be identically uh, through the whole uh, die that the body diode, uh, each one uh, acts simultaneously and you do not get any hot spots. That's a comment from an old man here. Now, let the experts in the round give their comments. So I'm, I'm not clearly sure if the reverse current is, is meant here. Um, we could um, put more philosophy in that question. Um, okay. Um, I haven't heard of any, any problems passing current or uh, um, reasonably um, amount of current through um, a body diet in, in a forward direction leads to any, any um, long-term issues. Um, what um, may be the effect that it's, the device is getting um, hotter than normal, which then can um, actually cause some issues if the cooling of the device isn't um, sufficient. That's correct, uh, Salvatore. Any, any semiconductor device is limited by the thermals that the Yangtian temperature has to be in its limits. Otherwise, you destroy the device. So the data sheets give good uh, information about that in general. Okay, address to Tobias. After all, e-mobility is not just cars. What other applications are there in this field that already use SIC? 
Thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the applications we are already seeing using quite a lot of silicon carbide is uh, charging. Also EV charging, especially high power chargers, 100 kilowatt up to 350 kilowatts. And in these regards, also charger for e-buses, uh, no matter if it's this kind of uh, pantograph bus, uh, where you have a bus with a pantograph will can charge its batteries during a pickup stop while people are leaving or entering the bus, or if it is a kind of a stationary um, charging uh, during the night when the bus is not in operation, and as well uh, on, on the mining uh, vehicles or the heavy vehicle vehicles uh, used there. Um, if we make it even a little bit broader, the complete view, and we also consider um, short to ship um, supplies, so supplies um, um, feeding ships in the harbor that they can switch off their, their auxiliary generators and motors and uh, that they can get connected to, to grids. Uh, there we also see um, quite a fast uh, change uh, towards silicon carbide. Um, especially there uh, to limit the weight and the size of this uh, equipment you need uh, on side of a harbor. So these are for sure applications where we see this um, uh, silicon carbide in e-mobility. Let me just add one uh, area that's traction. I know that the Shinkansen is using SIC modules for a while and uh, that's, uh, that's uh, known for a while. Articles have mentioned that in the magazine in the past. Thanks for mentioning both, yes, of course, confirmed, yeah. Let's see what my backstage is telling me. There is one more coming, here we go. Okay, to Francesco. You have shown results on 1200 volt. Would you expect that 650 or 900 volt devices will behave differently? Uh, thank you for your question, Bodo. Yeah, yes, definitely, uh, I would. Um, basically, I think the results you are mentioning uh, refer to my recent paper uh, you published. Thanks a lot for that. And that was and that was uh, about you know uh, short circuit on silicon carbide uh, modules. And yes, that was for twelve hundred volts. And uh, well, uh, maybe uh, it's not. There is no need to to point out. Maybe yes, uh, that short circuit is basically in a very energetic event. So it's everything about energy, which ends up in, uh, in overheating and eventually damaging the junction and the insulation layers. So uh, the answer is definitely yes. If you go lower in voltage, you are going lower in uh, power and energy. And this means that uh, obviously your withstanding capacity becomes, becomes higher. And this is kind of, uh, I would say, good news, uh, at, at, at least for a given market segment. Uh, well, I would say medium, medium power traction applications, uh, automotive application rather, um, which is definitely, uh, you know, looking at the 900 volts products. Then in that case, I would say things go a little bit better. On the other side, if you think of, well, you mentioned the trains, that's out of discussion because you need higher voltage components, no doubt. But also if you think of trucks, I'm involved uh, now uh, in this very moment in an Horizon Europe application, we're investigating trucks and inverters for uh, electric trucks. And there is no way you have to go 1200 volts. So that's nothing new for, no, no good news for, for that level, for that segment, I would say. But yes, for cars, you know, in the range of 100 kilowatts, then I would say, yes, it is better. Yes. Thank you. Okay, to Thomas, there are several gate resistor values named in a different application nodes. Are there any default values? Um, there's a short and there's a long answer to it. The short one, no. Um, the, the long one is it really depends on the application. Um, going with the gate resistors on, on, on SIG MOSFETs to, to higher values leads to 
a slower slope um, from switching on or switching off um, in terms of voltage and current. Um, this also means that you have increased losses on your device. Um, so this means you're less efficient, you need more cooling, but um, your EMC behavior is more calm than switching fast. So that's, that's a common fact. Um, the, the, um, normally you aim to um, lower gate resistor values, but it really depends if you have, for example, uh, a charger which produces uh, several hundred volts and, and several kilo um, uh, watts, uh, and you have like three meters of wires attached to it, um, it's more likely that you run into some EMC issues um, than when you have like a motor inverter directly touched to your brushless DC um, motor uh, there. So um, it really depends. Um, if you want to bu build a application node in your lab, you can start with those, um, but it really then depends and you need to go through several um, optimization loops then to find the right gate drive resistor values um, that suit your application. Thank you, Thomas. Now we approach our last question before we end our round table, our tech talk. And uh, the question is, about qualifying SIC modules according to AQG324 recommendations. Whatever that is, you know it better. Let me learn from your comments. I would like to join the question, not the answer. I mean, okay. I'm very. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. It's about reliability, Bodo. So yeah, uh, yeah. but I, I, I don't know uh, what's behind AQG324 uh, in detail. I, uh, I need to, to find out for me what that reliability uh, is in, in reality and written down what it need to perform. Uh, and for what uh, market segment it's written. So I know that there are uh, certain things written for automotive, for space, but that's uh, to me unknown at the moment. But anybody of you are able to answer to that? So I can I can start to answer. Um, I try to make it short. I cannot um, yeah. fully explain the content of the AKQ uh, three two four, but all what he said is of course is is correct. It, it's on power semiconductor reliability um, on ECP. Um, we follow these recommendations. Uh, we have also brought in our inputs, and I think that's one of the one of the really good things uh, that this is not coming from a kind of extra uh, group of people uh, just thinking about these topics, but it's also including some experience, some results um, out of uh, industrial application uh, from, from supplier side as well as from customer side. And uh, we are dedicated to, um, uh, to follow these recommendations with our modules being used in, in, in these applications, such as Roadpack as an example for e-mobility. And we are following that. And we are also uh, continuously working um, on all these uh, rules, on these procedures uh, to make them even better, um, even uh, better performing um, uh, or better reproducing uh, what the device might later on see in, in real use in an e-mobility application. Thank you, Tobias. That was our last question. Thank you to the auditorium. Thank you to the presenter on the stage. Looking forward to our next uh, session in four uh, in three months. Thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>